The case numbers are staggering and still rising. Each day, at tremendous personal risk, healthcare workers walk into work knowing this could be the day they get infected. We owe a debt of gratitude to COVID-19 pandemic heroes, such as frontline nurses and doctors for their courage and service. They've been honored as heroes by other frontline workers as police and firefighters across the country have lined up at hospitals to applaud the dedication of the healthcare workers. They have also been hailed as heroes as fighter jets perform flyovers at many hospitals from California to New York and everywhere in between. There are also many healthcare heroes we don't hear about. Today we'll discuss the behind the scenes role of the Infection Prevention and Control or IPC professional. Infection preventionists are the translators and communicators of information from sources such as the Centers for Disease Control. Our topic of IPC will be presented in three parts. This first part will focus on its history and describe its role in healthcare. We'll learn how we can use a black light to identify areas of our hands we don't wash well, and we'll learn the right way to wash our hands using a seven-step method. I'm Diane Lauman of The Better Part. I'd like to introduce my guests who are infection preventionists or IPs in the acute healthcare setting. They'll describe for us the very important role they play in the safety of patients and healthcare workers. I'd like to first introduce Stephanie Leong. Stephanie is the current president of the San Francisco Bay Area Chapter of APIC, or the Association for Professionals in Infection Control. Stephanie has 10 years of nursing experience and has a master's in nursing science. She has six years of infection prevention experience and is board certified in infection control. Stephanie, can you tell us what has been your process to becoming an IP? Yeah, thanks Diane, happy to be here. My journey uh, for becoming an IP really started when I pursued an advanced degree in nursing. Um, part of my clinical rotation, I worked with the quality department and was introduced to the infection prevention and control team. I was able to have several months of hands-on experience with the infection control team and really learned the important role they had in the healthcare setting. I grew to uh, really love and enjoy what they did. And so after I graduated, I was able to have an opportunity to become, um, to you know, obtain a role in infection prevention. Um, and with that experience, I was able to study for my exam and pass my CIC. That's great. It sounds like um, nursing school introduces the students to infection prevention early on. So that's wonderful. My next guest is Dr. Pansy Leong Chen. Pansy has been certified in infection control for over 30 years. She has served in senior IP positions in New York, California, and Canada. She recently completed her doctorate in nursing practice. Pansy has also served as a past president of her local chapter of APIC in New York City. She has been a subject matter expert, reviewer, and contributor to the American Journal of Nursing. Pansy, can you describe for us how you became interested in IP? Thank you, Diane, for having me. So um, yeah, when I first started in infection control some 30 years ago, um, it was a relatively new profession, at least if, uh, in Canada anyway. And I was really fortunate um, that when a position, a full-time position uh, opened up, I applied and then they hired me uh, because of my, probably because of my public health experience. Um, the, I, the then IP, the full-time IP there um, had to take on the part-time hours because of her family situation. Um, but she stayed on and she really helped and trained and mentored me uh, to learn the profession. And then the rest is history. That's great. You were very fortunate to have a mentor to guide you through. My next guest is Priya Pandya Orozco. Priya has been in infection prevention and control for 11 years in various leadership positions, and she's been a nurse for 23 years. 
She has a master's in nursing and is a public health nurse and is board certified in infection control as well. Priya, can you walk us through how you became an infection preventionist? Absolutely, and thank you for having me, Diane. So in 2009, there was the H1N1 pandemic, as some of you may remember, and I was the director of immunizations for Alameda County Public Health. Um, and I worked very closely with communicable diseases as well as the infection preventionists um, throughout the Alameda County Health System. It was during this time that I came so excited about the impact that infection prevention can have on all aspects of human life, social, behavioral, and economical. This field has so much growth potential and a constant need and a, um, to strategize and adapt, and I found these aspects to be inspiring and something I desperately wanted to be a part of. Welcome, Priya, and thank you to all of you for joining. I'd like to start with the history of infection prevention. Priya, can you walk us through how and when the profession was started? Absolutely. So many believe that there are two pioneers of infection prevention, and one is a Hungarian doctor with the name of Ignaz Semmelweis, and also Florence Nightingale, one of the leading nurses. Both of them started around our, their, their, their push-outs during this time were around the mid-18th century, and Dr. Semmelweis conducted um, some observational studies regarding the high mortality rate that he saw in the labor and delivery. And he did something as simple as just implementing hand hygiene, making sure people wash their hands um, at appropriate intervals. And with doing that, he was able to see a significant drop in the mortality rate in labor and delivery. Florence Nightingale did something similar. During uh, the Crimean War, she led a team of 38 nurses, and she, they arrived in Turkey and actually were working in a hospital and realized that the, the conditions were so unsanitary. Uh, patients had not, um, no clean water, their clothes were dirty, um, and not to mention that you know, the floors were, had um, ex excrement and there were rodents. So she put to work her team of nurses to clean the environment, make sure patients had clean food, clean running water, and also hand hygiene was also implemented. And when she took, she took really good records. And so she saw that when she arrived, 32% um, was, was the percentage of the case fatality rates in that hospital. And after all of her implementation activities, she um, was able to reduce that uh, case fatality rate to 2%. So we can see simple strategies such as cleaning the environment, washing our hands, can really help mitigate any prevention of infection. That's great. We really appreciate the pioneering work that Dr. Semmelweis and Florence Nightingale did. Stephanie, can you tell us who today's IPs are? Yes, of course. Infection preventionists are very truly specialized professionals who really focus and direct their activities to prevent and decrease infections. Most IPs today are nurses, epidemiologists, uh, public health professionals, and other healthcare professionals who um, prevent the spread of infections. So there is a survey, uh, according to the 2015 uh, APIC mega survey, 40% uh, of infection preventionists have greater than five years of experience. About 50% of, uh, 50 of them are certified in infection control. Majority of them are female, and they age, the age group is of uh, 55 to 65 years old. Um, for those who are interested in the infection prevention uh, career, I highly uh, you know, encourage you consider, we definitely need more IPs out there. That's great. And what about the educational and licensing requirements and backgrounds? Yeah, the majority of the infection preventionists do have an RN degree with a minimum of a bachelor's degree. Um, some of the other IPs do have background in public health or microbiology, laboratory sciences, and some are foreign trained clinicians. Okay, um, Pansy, can you tell us where the, what the settings are where IPs work? Sure. Um, IPs traditionally work in uh, health acute care uh, hospitals and some in academic university hospital settings. Uh, but this, since then, IPs, have, uh, the role have expanded and we are into skilled nursing facility, long-term care facilities, uh, dialysis center, uh, some pharmaceutical and even in manufacturer companies, uh, um, such as the uh, manufacturer of chemicals or disinfectants. I can see where IPs would really be needed in all of those environments. That's great. Um, 
Pansy, I know our viewers would be very interested in finding out exactly what it is you do. Can you describe roles and responsibilities of infection preventionists? Yeah, um, IPs uh, wear many hats. Um, we are the uh, consultants, we're educators, uh, advocates, advisors, detectives, and, and uh, some, re some are researchers. So we work with most um, everyone uh, in the healthcare setting. Uh, first and foremost, we um, do investigation, uh, we do surveillance to uh, implement strategies uh, to prevent um, hospital acquired infections. Uh, we work with clinicians to make sure that um, our implementation strategies are evidence-based. Um, we um, work with uh, occupational health and employee health ser uh, services, um, especially when there's a communicable disease exposure um, that we need to follow up and investigate, make sure that all communicable diseases are reported uh, to public health, such as COVID-19 is a reportable disease um, that needs to be reported. We work with uh, the end users, such as environmental health staff, to make sure that uh, they understand that the products, the chemicals, the disinfectants that they use are appropriately, um, that they use appropriately and also wear the appropriate PPEs. And um, so the list goes on, um, but you no, know, it's, um, it's a lot of things that we do. And um, yeah, it, it's just, um, it's, it's really interesting that every day uh, we do some of it or some days we do all of it at the same, on the same day. Well, it sounds like you have a very full plate every day. Yeah. Um, so Priya, um, before the COVID-19 pandemic, can you describe what your typical work week would, would have looked like? Yeah, absolutely. And Pansy touched on a lot of this. So um, to really summarize, education is the key. Um, I think making sure that all of uh, our healthcare staff, especially our EVS, who are who might be known as housekeeping, um, all healthcare workers, including radiology lab personnel, understand the basics of infection prevention and control. The simple basics such as washing your hands and the importance of when to wash the hands. Um, we also work and focus on surveillance and investigation. As Pansy said, we look at hospital acquired infections, assuring that um, we review all lab cultures that are coming in and also documentation that might lead to a possible exposure um, that uh, will also lead to collaborating with our occupational or employee health services. Um, and de identifying the infections, once we do cl uh, clearly meet criteria for an infection, there are, those things drop into two little buckets for me in my mind. One is, again, we would review the lab culture's chart, chart documentation for the clinical symptoms of the infection and determine if we met CDC or NHSN, which is the CDC database for hospital acquired infection criteria. And additionally, this review, once we confirm it, will lead to any exposure of possible communicable disease, which will require follow-up. And the, we will also work on prevention. Again, some, one, of a, one of the leaders of infection control once shared with me that prevention is at the front lines and is not behind your desk. And I remember that never left me. That's been about like 14, 12, 13 years ago now. And that always stays with me. So whenever I'm looking and doing the work and trying to, you know, create presentations to share with the staff, I really want to make sure that, that me and my team are actually out on the floors, making sure that the staff know us, have a way and a touch point to reach us. Again, that leans into education. Another portion of the time that we spend is on management and communication of everything that I've just mentioned, making sure that our communication is clear to the staff and the leaders. And we, in, when we identify an infection, we, we educate and we share that information as quickly as possible so that we can get to prevention. Um, we are also heavily into education and research and staying abreast of the greatest and the latest and the greatest of all the development of the evidence-based practices that are out there and also participating in creating evidence-based practices. We also work with the environment and construction risk assessments. A lot of people don't think that um, infection prevention is involved in construction, but we quite are heavily involved in making sure the environment is clean and safe for patients and staff and incorporating rounds into areas that we know where construction is being done to assure those uh, mitigation strategies to prevent any dust or uh, contamination of the environment are adhered to. Um, we also work with our sterile processing department, which is in charge of a cleaning instrumentation to assure that they are following manufacturer cleaning guidelines. Um, and I mentioned before about uh, occupational health, but that's a very big bucket that we want to, we partner with these amazing colleagues to make sure that we keep everyone safe and assure that when, when there is an exposure that we follow up quickly. 
That sounds like the entirety of an organization. That's great. Everything from patient care areas to employee health and even to construction sites. So you are um, needed all over. I see on television that infectious disease physicians are interviewed, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. It seems like their work may be similar to yours. Um, Pansy, can you tell us maybe the difference between what an ID physician does and what you do, and how do you collaborate? Sure. So uh, infectious disease physicians, they focus on the diagnosis and treatment of an infection um, processes or infectious disease. Um, whereas we, um, as infection preventionists, you uh, hear what uh, Priya described, we do the implementation or the groundwork, so to speak, uh, working with health, uh, frontline healthcare workers to make sure that um, we uh, protect and prevent um, uh, any transmission of infections for our staff and for our patients. However, uh, we do collaborate very closely with, with our infectious disease physicians um, and oftentimes they are the infection control officer or the epidemiologist for the for the hospital. So, so we but um, uh, we do work together to implement the infection control program uh, for the facility. Okay, so you do much of the interfacing between um, the hospital's program of IP and the frontline workers, and so you're doing a lot of teaching. Correct. Priya mentioned that your work includes a lot of education and research. Pansy, can you tell us if there are websites that you routinely monitor? Sure. Um, so there are many websites that we um, monitor, uh, but the ones that we frequently uh, go to, uh, definitely the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, the state and county public health, depending on where you live, the public health, the local public health uh, will have um, information on their website, uh, the World Health Organization, the uh, uh, Joint Commission, and then of course um, the APIC uh, website. Okay, I'm, I'm sure it's important for the um, infection preventionists to be able to translate what is on those websites back to your organization. We mentioned APIC earlier, and Stephanie, as the local chapter president of APIC, can you describe its mission and why an association is helpful to members? Absolutely. APIC is the leading professional association for infection prevention. Um, the association does have more than 15,000 members, and their mission is really to create a safer world through preventing healthcare associated infections. Being part of APIC is very beneficial for the IP community. Um, APIC provides valuable resources, researching, new education, and training focused on infection prevention and control. APIC also holds educational conferences and events. The, the membership also includes a joining of a local chapter for support. I understand there's a national association. How does the national APIC support local chapters? Yeah, the national APIC oversees and provide ongoing member support at the local level. And the local level, um, the chapters offer educational opportunities, structured knowledge learning related to new infection prevention best practices, also products out there, and advocate for infection prevention issues. They foster communication and networking opportunities, as well as direct and support and improve the practice and management of infection control. In addition, um, the local chapters do make it a priority to welcome new um, members and they um, definitely help recruit and mentor and support them. And all of, the, uh, all of this work does support an overarching goal of patient safety. The local chapter also provides support and certification in infection control, prevention and control. Um, the local chapters provide resources um, including the exam prep books that members can uh, use to study and prep for the CIC. And in addition, the local chapter acknowledges newly certified CIC and renewal of CIC in our local cha APIC chapter meetings. I know all three of you are certified in um, as CICs. Can you explain what that means and why it is helpful to become certified? Yeah, so CIC stands for Certified in Infection Control, and it's accredited by Certification Board of Infection Control and Epidemiology, which is CBIC. 
Um, and having your CIC credentials really identifies the healthcare professional professionals who have demonstrated their knowledge mastery in infection prevention and control. It shows a commit, commitment to best practices in infection control and improved patient care. By having your CIC, it really does show your commitment to professional growth. And what are some of the areas of study for the exam? Yeah, so the CIC exam does consist of several domains. Um, some of them are infectious disease processes, surveillance, employee health, education, research, and sterile processing. Yeah, that's great. As a healthcare consumer, I really appreciate knowing the vast knowledge that certified ICs have um, while they're working to make my stay at a hospital safer. Stephanie, I'd like to now talk about hand washing. I know it's one of the fundamental practices to minimize the spread of infection. Is there a way for us to know whether or not we're doing a good job of washing our hands? As a matter of fact, there is. So there is a way um, where you could apply a lotion or gel that simulates uh, as germs. So if you put it under a fluorescent light, your hands will uh, basically glow up and that sim simulates as germs when you're first applying the lotion or gel. And afterwards, when you do your hand hygiene um, by you know, making sure that you wash your hands for at least 20 seconds and covering all the surfaces, um, after you washed your hands, uh, you would put the fluorescent light over it. And for those areas that are missed, it'll definitely glow up. So a lot of the common areas are in between the fingers and also the nail beds. Um, and so there are definitely advanced technology that does show, um, you know, the effectiveness of hand washing and also using alcohol degermer. That's great. So looking at that black light photo, I can see what you're talking about in terms of the knuckles and between the fingers that maybe we were not washing those areas as well as we should. Priya, I know that um, from looking at that black light photo and there are those areas where we may be missing, um, can you tell us the proper way or the right way to wash our hands and for how much time should we be doing that? Absolutely. We're going to be watching a video in a few seconds um, that shows you the seven steps of hand hygiene that's also narrated. Um, and uh, you'll see how we get through all the areas, including our fingertips and our wrists. Let's review the proper hand washing process. First, wet your hands under a stream of water and apply sufficient soap to cover all surfaces of your hands. We're now ready to perform the seven hand washing steps. Step one, rub your hands together palm to palm. Next, with your right palm, rub the back of your left hand. Then using your left palm, rub the back of your right hand. Third, massage your hands palm to palm, interlacing your fingers. Fourth, with your fingers interlocked, rub the back of your fingers against the palm of the other hand. Step five, scrub your right thumb with your left hand and vice versa. Step six, Rub the fingertips of one hand into the palm of the other, then switch. The seventh step is to scrub your wrists, left wrist with right hand, and repeat for right wrist. Finally, rinse your hands thoroughly with water, then dry with a towel. This process should take at least 20 seconds. So, uh as we watch the video, we noticed that there are um, some differences that we would have normally in our own homes, which the faucet was electronic. So it's important to remember that we're turning off those manual faucets with a paper towel, especially when we're in public restrooms, and as we exit using a paper towel to exit the restroom doors, because many people do not wash their hands effectively after toileting. Okay, thank you, Priya, for showing us that seven-step method. and. Um, it was great to see the blacklight demonstration because it really showed us what we need to do. And I know that I'll be washing my hands a little bit more thoroughly and to my favorite song for at least 20 seconds. We now know the importance of the IPC function and its important role in minimizing the spread of infection to patients and healthcare workers. Infection prevention has worked side by side with infectious disease physicians to provide guidance to keep everyone safe. I hope you'll tune in to part two of our IPC series in which we'll describe in more detail the IPC function and its response to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
you'll see a demonstration of a UV robot used to disinfect rooms, and you'll see a device that's used to test surfaces after they've been cleaned to see if they've been cleaned adequately. I'd like to thank our guests, Priya, Pansy, and Stephanie, and I'd also like to thank you, our viewers, for watching The Better Part.